All right. Hello, Behind the Knife listeners. So welcome to our inaugural episode of Clinical Challenges in Colorectal Surgery. So have you, as you've probably heard by now, Behind the Knife has expanded to include about 20 specialty teams that are going to be providing regular specialty-specific content over the coming years. And I'm thrilled to introduce our team. So one of two colorectal teams that are going to be providing in-depth content focusing exclusively on the best surgical specialty, that's colorectal surgery. We are the team from Leahy. Go Leahy. Whoop. Uh, the other team's gonna be coming to you from the University of Montreal. Uh, so honored to introduce our team. And so I'm gonna start with Dr. Peter West Marcello. Hey John, uh, uh, West, West was my mom's maiden name, just, just so you know. I didn't know that. All right, uh, already learning things. Uh, so Peter is the chair of the Department of Colon and Rectal Surgery at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center. Uh, he completed his general surgery residency at Deaconess Harvard Surgical Service. Um, uh, he then went on to complete colorectal fellowship at Leahy. He then spent two years working at Cleveland Clinic under Dr. Vic Fazio and actually worked closely with one of uh, my mentors, Jeffrey Milsom, before returning to uh, Leahy. Peter's won numerous awards over the years, but is probably uh, most proud of his um, Sages Foundation Master Educator Award and the Mentors Award from ASCRS. Uh, welcome, Peter. Uh, it's an honor to work together on this series. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to join the team, I guess, as the old guy. Uh, I want you to note, though, I'm, you know, not much up here, but I got my poop emoji uh, right uh, on my cap for you guys, so uh, you can see us. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Tess Aulette. Tess is uh, one of our two colorful fellows here at Leahy this year. Uh, Tess, what's your middle name? What? Hannah. Hannah. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, Tess, it, it, where's Tess come from? Do you know? Uh, the book, uh, Tess of the du Dubervilles. Was that book a and, book and movie? It was a movie, right? Yeah. It was a movie and a book, yeah. You'll have to check it out. I will. Uh, Tess completed a general surgery residency at the University of Vermont and actually spent a year during residency as a simulation fellow at UVM. So yeah, you could say, Tess, you're on your way to becoming a master educator. Tess, welcome to the team. And uh, John's going to put in another plug. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, Tess, this is going to be our second virtual education collaboration. Uh, so uh, welcome to the team and uh, tell us a little about that. Thanks guys. Yeah, very excited to be contributing to Behind the Knife uh, and thanks for uh, letting me give a quick plug. We have worked together this year on the Sunday uh, evening virtual education series in colorectal um, that you actually started last year and I've been lucky enough to kind of take take over to organize this past year. So we'll, uh, if you like what we uh, teach you today, we'll put a link in our show notes. So please check us out on Sundays. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so we hey, have a John, case. Uh, hold on a sec. Um, you haven't introduced yourself. Can I? Can I? Can I do the honors? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Okay. Okay. I said John Abelson uh, uh, joined us uh, here uh, this past year. He did his general surgery training at uh, Wheel Cornell in New York City with Jeff Milsom, who was my sensei, my mentor for laparoscopy. Um, he then did a colorectal fellowship in Wash U in St. Louis with a few Leahy alumni, including Matt Much uh, and my best friend and co-fellow, Tom Reed, who is our current president of the ASCRS. Uh, and then uh, I needed somebody to join us last year and we were fortunate to bring John out of fellowship uh, this past September. Uh, so John, uh, you've been happy to work here at Leahy, I hope? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say first year in practice, as uh, people talk about, is definitely a roller coaster of emotions, but overall- Thrilled to join the group and join a, a long line of excellent colorectal surgeons. All right, so enough with the introductions. Let's get this show on the road. Uh, and so for those of you who are listening on uh, audio, I'd encourage you to check out uh, our video. So we're going to be posting a YouTube video of this episode. Uh, and so um, uh, you'll, you'll be able to follow along with us. So uh, Tess, uh, this is a 57-year-old male. He had never had a colonoscopy before, no family history of colorectal polyps, noticed some blood in his stool and was sent for a colonoscopy. You do the colonoscopy and you see these pictures in the right colon. What are you thinking? All right, so here I'm looking at, uh, I'd say about a three centimeter polyp. Um, it looks like it's uh, spanning two folds. It, I'm a uh, little- 
Uh, yeah. How, how, I mean, you're guessing three. What do you do to gauge or help assess the size? Because that's a really important factor when doing colonoscopy. Yeah, that's um, so I guess um, what I've done before is we can use biopsy forceps to get an idea of how big. Um, how, how big are those? So about uh, two to four millimeters, a, a cold uh, forcep. All right. So, yeah, I agree. About three centimeters. So, yeah. And what about what else can you use? Uh, you could use a, a snare as well to get a sense of how big it is. Right. A small snare. How big are those roughly? Do you know? How long? Uh, a centimeter? Yeah, no, more about 17 millimeters on average for the and smalls and about almost three centimeters for a big. So uh, that gives you some sense when you open it up. And, and being accurate in your recording of the size, I think is really helpful uh, when you finally get your final specimen. But what else about when you look at this? Go ahead, keep going. Yeah, no, thank you. The um, I'm concerned, it, it looks a little ulcerated in the center of the lesion. Um, and then um, I guess I'd want to use uh, narrow band imaging to just get a sense of the pit pattern. Um, and then the other thing that I'm thinking about is I don't really see the posterior aspect of this polyp. So I'd, if possible, consider retroflexing just to get a better look at the uh, undersurface. All right, so you do that. Um, you have some nice pictures here and, and you brought up uh, narrow band imaging. So why don't you tell us what that helps with? Sure. Uh, so narrowband imaging or NBI is a mode on the scope. You press a button and it uh, puts, as you see the image on the left, uh, this kind of um, blue, uh, red hue. And this allows you to classify polyps um, as either hyperplastic adenomas or um, you know, possible cancers based on the morphology. There's different classification systems that you can use to help you um, uh, think about where these polyps fall into. Classically, we talk about the Kudo classification system, which you can see here, um, which helps to um, summarize the different uh, appearances of polyps. Um, and the most, I think the, the most often time that I've used this this year is um, helping to differentiate adenomas or hyperplastic polyps. Yeah, and I think that's really good. Like in the rectum, you got a small little polyp, you think it's hyperplastic, you can switch to this uh, and then you know, and see that it's a type two that would tell you it's hyperplastic. Um, and then look for the other characteristics uh, later on. And so Peter, I mean, a anything you would add about how you're differentiating the different types of polyps based on endoscopy? Like, are you using NBI in your practice? Yeah, and I think the, you know, the option is that uh, to use that or other technologies such as chromoendoscopy, uh, but that's a little bit more time and a little more hassle. So flipping onto the NBI, you can look at a pit pattern. What you're really looking for, if you're worried about that ulcer test, is that type four, type five. Um, those may give you a hint. Um, test other things you can do to kind of help uh, assess the polyp. Yeah. Um, so I'd, you can also take a biopsy forcep um, and and use that to. Um, almost like an extension to feel if the polyp is mobile, if it's soft, if it moves, um, that can really give you a sense of, uh, you know, depth of invasion, mm -hmm. as well as lifting the polyp. If, if it doesn't lift well, you'd be potentially concerned that it's, it's deeper. Yeah, I think anytime I see a larger polyp, uh, especially sessile polyp, I think a biopsy forcep, it's like a finger, you know, you just use it like the finger on the end and you can really get a good sense of fixation uh, going forward. All right, so back to the case. So uh, you, you use the biopsy forceps and you do see that it is somewhat mobile uh, and you take some biopsies and you wanna make sure you're taking biopsies in the ulcerated portion in the center of the polyp, not in the fluffy part in the periphery. Uh, and so then again, you know, for those of you who are following us on the video, you see this pathology uh, report, which reads superficial fragments of tubular villus adenoma, multiple levels examined. So Tess, what do you wanna do next? Well, so um, I guess based on this pathology and the fact that it sounds like it's a more mobile lesion makes me less concerned about a cancer. However, we can, you know, have a sampling error here. So given the size, the possible ulceration, it needs to be removed and it could be, have an underlying uh, malignancy. Um, so, you know, so far this year at Leahy, what I've seen is we'd bring this patient in um, to the office and talk to them about doing an endoscopic step-up approach and either doing an 
endoscopic mucosal resection in EMR or an endoscopic submucosal dissection in ESD, and then bring patients to the operating room if we're not able to do that and do it endoscopically, then proceed up to more invasive component, which would be, you know, either a combined uh, laparoscopic endoscopic approach or a, a colectomy. Um, I didn't really do this much in residency. We do it all the time here. Um, Dr. Marcelo, how often do you think this is done kind of outside of Leahy? Yeah, so, so this was actually um, something that we, I developed here or we developed here because patients are referred to you with polyps. And early in my career, um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, you, they were sent an unresectable polyp. And so um, we bring the patient to surgery, do a lap right colectomy. That's how I learned how to do a lot of colectomies for benign disease before we were doing cancers. You take it out and there was a five millimeter polyp inside. And you're like, did I really need to do this procedure? And, and so then if you want to do an advanced uh, endoscopic resection and you're in the endo unit and you go a little deep, now maybe you need the OR. So the concept was to bring the endoscopy unit and the OR together really as a hybrid unit. And so what we and, and the partners uh, back uh, recently developed was a program where uh, you tell the patient, look, we're gonna come in and we're gonna look at the polyp. So you just bring them into the OR on a stretcher and do propofol. Use a high definition uh, pediatric colonoscope, look at the polyp and assess the uh, resectability. And if it looks resectable, then um, use either the single channel or a double channel scope, which we'll talk about later, uh, and uh, plan to remove it. And then if you need help, either uh, a combined endolaparoscopic approach or, or something, or, or a colectomy, you just move the patient from the stretcher onto the OR table under one setting. So one prep, one setting. And when the polyp wake, when the patient wakes up, the polyp is gone. And so that concept of getting it all done in one place uh, by one person, and that's where I thought that a colorectal surgeon was, was really the best one to, to try to do this. John, did you ever see anything like this in your, your training or, or concepts? Yeah, not, not as much. I mean, I was exposed to it during colorectal fellowship. Uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Sang Lee sponsors a course at, it, at it, um, uh, USC uh, and, um, you know, and, and really the colorectal surgeons who are doing a lot of this advanced endoscopy work will talk about this approach. And I did get exposed to some of it, as I mentioned, you know, with Dr. Milsom during residency, but, um, you know, the, I think it really is a, an important technique to be able to offer to your patients. So, you know, we're, we're talking about the different options and, and, you know, have to ask, you know, Tess, what do you think the, the experience has been here uh, in terms of doing that? Is that, is this a safe, effective approach? You know, how much, how much does it cost? How much time does it take? Are patients doing okay with it? Yeah. I mean, so far my experience this year, it's been, it's been great. Um, and I can, it kind of reinforces some of the work that, uh, Leahy has already published on this. Um, a few years back, uh, Jessica Cohan, Colleen Donahue, and Haddon Pantel actually um, published a, a paper in, um, in DCR uh, looking at the experience at Leahy where um, we had endoscopically unresectable polyps that were 15 to 50 millimeters in size who were referred um, and then basically underwent either colectomy or this endoscopic step-up approach. Um, we had 52 patients who had a colectomy, 38 who ultimately had this endoscopic step-up approach. And what we found was that when we compared the two patients who under, underwent a colectomy or uh, the endoscopic step-up ha actually had fewer complications, shorter lengths of stay um, compared to the colectomy. And so, you know, in addition to, you know, saving the patient a colectomy, you know, what, what are potential other benefits of this approach, would you say? So uh, cost as well. Um, again, my, my experience this year, patients will either go home that, that same day or, you know, stay one night and are out the next day. So, you know, they found um, in reviewing this that patients in the step up group had about half the hospital costs and, and less uh, insurer payments as well. So I think, you know, that's also a huge, huge benefit. And I will say before we, we go on further is, is that the real benefit is for the patient to get everything done in one step, um, in, in one bowel prep, and to know that they'll be taken care of. And, and it's a little hard initially to get them to agree. Like, your doctor, you're going to go from a polypectomy maybe to a colectomy, and I'm not going to know. I'm like, 
well, if I woke you up and told you you need your colon out, would you want me to put you back to sleep? They go, yeah, well, well, that's what we're going to do. And they got over that uh, concept. And, and it also empowers you as a surgical endoscopist to do more aggressive you know, endoscopic work because you have the OR right there available to you. There's no fear that something bad is going to happen. So in addition to the benefit, obviously, of less pain, uh, quicker recovery, and most of the time uh, uh, doing things uh, uh, less, less dramatically for the patient, the benefit really is to get it all done in one, one stop shopping. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to say it, it makes a lot of sense to me and, and we've done a few of these cases together and, you know, I think we've had some great, you know, great outcomes. What, what I'm still sort of struggling early in my career to figure out is why isn't this more commonly used? Yeah, well, I think, you know, as the main thing that drives a lot of things is, is, the, is the money. You know, for the insurers, it costs a lot less to pay for an, even an advanced endoscopic procedure. Uh, the hospital actually breaks even or loses a bit of money on these procedures. If you do a colectomy, the hospital makes a fair bit of money. Um, in, a, in a model of an ACU model, uh, it, it will make sense to do this. And I think that's where we're going. But also for the doctors, the RBUs, uh, Tess, if you do a lap colectomy, how, how many RBUs do you get, do you know? I'd say 20. All right. That's for a right colectomy. You know, a left colectomy gets you 30. Uh, I actually think that sometimes a, a left colectomy is hard, is easier than a right colectomy, but the RBUs is different. Do you know what you get for a colonoscopy test? Five. No, that's the, that's if you do a colonoscopy and a polypectomy or a biopsy. If you just okay. do a colonoscopy, two. it's two and a half. Two, okay. Three and a half. All right, close enough. So. It, it, there's, you're disincentivized to do this because you, you don't generate your RVUs uh, and the hospital potentially doesn't make enough. But in the future, it, it will be aligned to where I think uh, the RVUs, uh, the, the reimbursement is appropriate for this and the savings to the patient. All right. Well, great tangent, team. Let's get back to uh, our patient. So uh, um, I'll stop. I'll summarize our case for our listeners again. So we have a three centimeter polyp in the right colon. Uh, there is some central ulceration that seems to be fairly mobile, uh, round pit pattern on NBI. We took some biopsies, no evidence of malignancy. Uh, and so I'll just sort of dump to the chase and say we did take them for an endoscopic step up approach. Fortunately, we were able to get this out endoscopically and we did not need to do an abdominal surgery. Uh, we actually ended up using a combination of EMR, so endoscopic mucosal resection, as well as ESD, endoscopic submucosal dissection, uh, to get the polyp, polyp off on block. And we'll review the pathology in a bit. But Peter, before we get there, can you talk about the difference between EMR and ESD? Yeah, so the technique of EMR is uh, basically removing a polyp uh, piecemeal. Um, getting all the mucosa down to the, the down to the submucosa, but you're going to do it if, uh, in pieces for the most part. Now, sometimes you can do it all in one, but often it may require more than one. And and uh, an ESD is a totally different beast for an animal. It's where you use a knife blade, and we'll show that in a minute. The main important part is thinking about the risks. And taking off a piecemeal polypectomy, this sure there's a risk of perforation, but but usually it's not as high as a risk of an ESD. So. For me, who gets an EMR versus who gets an ESD? If you've got um, an elderly patient with a sesalcerated adenoma with no dysplasia in the right colon, I'm gonna use a, a, an EMR technique because the risk of perforation is a lot less. If I've got a fit young patient with a polyp with high grade dysplasia, I'm gonna to wanna to remove that all in, in one section. And so I'm gonna then move on to more of an ESD type procedure. And so then, you know, in your practice, you know, how are you actually doing this? I mean, what's the technique? Yeah, so we've modified uh, our EMR approach because that's usually taking a single snare going out and injecting and trying to get around a polyp. And if a polyp is sessile, it's really hard to get graft or capture onto the polyp. So we developed sort of a double channel EMR technique. The double channel colonoscope, is it, it, it's bell bottoms. It's all an old school technology, came out in the 90s, and now we bring it back. You have to learn to uh, hold the scope uh, in one hand and manipulate the two channels uh, with the other hand. And so basically what you do here is inject underneath the polyp. And then with the left uh, channel, I use a biopsy forceps. And the right channel is the snare. So you open up the snare, 
you pass the biopsy forcep through the snare in which you pull up on the polyp. Then with the snare in the right hand, you push down on the snare and you can engage a very flat polyp also and remove the polyp. And not only is it great for removing the polyp, it's also really cool for closure where you can grab on the far side with the biopsy forcep uh, and then peg the, um, the uh, clip on the near side and pull the uh, far side in as you close with the clip to get really a full thickness closure. So that's our current technique for uh, EMR. Now for ESD, that is where you use a, a clear cap on the end of the scope. You inject the same injectate uh, to stay there. But now you're gonna use a knife blade and you have to control the knife blade to stay in that beautiful plane between mucosa and submucosa. And as you complete the dissection, you'll go underneath the whole polyp all the way around the edge and remove it. So uh, EMR, basically glorified polypectomy, but with a double channel, you can get the entire lesion out. ESD, all out on block resection, but requires an, ex an exquisitely delicate uh, skill set to be able to do. Well, thanks for that description, Peter. And I'll just put in another plug, if you're listening over audio, to hop on over to YouTube and watch the video recording. We have some, some great um, you know, video just sort of describing these techniques that uh, Peter was just describing. Um, all right, so uh, Tess, you, you get the polyp off uh, and, you, and you get it out. Are you done? Uh, no, so I'd want to I'd want to close the defect. Um, typically, we do this with clips. Um, there are ways that you can endoscopically suture, um, but I would I would plan to clip it. And, and Tess, why, why are you going to close it? What are you worried about? So you worry about bleeding or delayed bleeding. So that's that's really the reason to close these defects. Not perforation. Uh, no, not, not that I'm aware of. The reason you really close these is, is for bleeding. And, and I agree with you that I think the bleeding is the main issue. You get this big raw surface. But I also think that with the double channel EMR technique, by getting bigger bites, by using that other area, you probably get a much better closure. And I've had areas of small perforation in the right colon that just with clips, we've closed it successfully and have, have watched those patients. Right. So, you know, you're taking the polyp out, you're putting in a Roth net, uh, you know, we routinely will tattoo the area uh, just so we really know exactly where it is uh, so we can perform uh, adequate surveillance. Uh, you know, I'll also say that every single polyp we're removing, we're putting on a cork board. John, uh, yeah, so why, why are you doing that? Tell us a little bit more about the cork board. So, uh, I mean, we're doing cork board because we really want to alert the pathologist to say we care about the margins. So tell us what our deep margin is. And tell us, what, what if you get a, a 1.5 centimeter pedunculated polyp, you take it off in the endo unit? Should, should that go on cork? Yeah, I would still put it on cork. Yeah, so cork in every, every room you're doing endoscopy, right? So pin it out, and that tells your pathologist uh, we care, and hopefully they do. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll fast forward to the pathology. So for this patient, and again, if you're not watching on the video, I'll just read the, the path report. So uh, tubular villus adenoma with high-grade dysplasia and intramucosal adenocarcinoma, no invasive carcinoma. Uh, there's adenoma at the inked margin, but no high-grade dysplasia at the margin. Uh, so Tess, your thoughts about this? Are we booking them for an immediate right colectomy, immediate you know, endoscopic uh, procedure, remove some more tissue. What are your thoughts? No, so this is an intramucosal eye cancer. I would not go back in endoscopically. I don't think you're, you're not going to see anything. We closed it with clips um, and I wouldn't recommend a colectomy in this case. Yeah, but Tess, you know, the, the, the gastrologist told the patient already that they have adenocarcinoma, you know, uh, uh, and now you're seeing them and they're often sometimes getting the reports before you get them. Um, um, wouldn't there be some benefit for colectomy? So in this case, our margin for dysplasia and cancer are negative um, and it was only mucosal. Um, so really the only reason to be doing a colectomy is for the you know, theoretical possibility of spread to the lymph nodes. Okay, so, so uh, how do you estimate the risk for uh, lymph node spread? Well, so, you know, for this case, I'd, I'd say less than 1%, um, again, given the pathology report that we have. There are 
a couple of different classification systems that are really helpful in giving patients estimates hold, for these. Hold on a second, Tess. John, do you agree with that? Less than 1%? What do you think? Yes, way less than 1%. Yeah, and I agree. And I think the, the, you've just got to then dismiss to the patient that, look, while, the, while your GI doctor said that, that this was cancer, it really is, in our eyes, um, cured by the polypectomy that was done. Go on, Tess. Tell us about the classifications. Yeah, so um, we, there's two classification systems that we think about. Um, for sessile polyps, we use the Kikuchi classification system, and this divides the submucosa into three layers, um, which we call as SM1, the upper third, SM2, the middle third, and then SM3, which is a lower third. And basically the deeper the level of invasion into the submucosa, the higher risk for lymph node involvement. Um, and since this did not involve the submucosa, that's why I said it was very low risk. Um, for pedunculated polyps, we use the Haggett classification, and this is used um, again, for pedunculated polyps, and you have levels um, zero to three, um, and those patients have no invasion into the submucosa, and those have a very low risk of lymph node involvement, less than 1%, whereas the Haggett level four, where it's getting into the submucosa, those have higher risk of lymph node involvement, anywhere from 12 to 25%. Hey, Tess, do you know who Haggett was? I don't. Right, John, do you know? I, I honestly, I a, forget. A, a, a GI pathologist. That's my guy. GI pathologist at the Deaconess where I train, baby. That's, you know, he's from my home turf. So yeah. um, he had some unfortunate events later that I won't discuss, but, but yeah, he was a pathologist and came back and looked at this, which is really kind of uh, interesting. All right, uh, John, an SM1 uh, lesion, right, in the upper third, how deep is that? I mean, the Japanese don't use the, the Kikuchi classification routinely, they, they go by depth. So what depth is that? Do you know? Millimeter? Yeah. And, and how many microns is that test? 10. No, I add, a, I add uh, two more zeros. A thousand I'll microns. Bet. So an SM1 is less than a millimeter or less than a thousand microns when you look at it. So there's your extra tidbit for the day. Nice. Okay. All right, good. Um, so I agree with that. You know, we get referrals from the docs and you got to make the balance. John, what, what's the balance need to be between here, you know, uh, moving forward? Yeah. So I, and, and I mean, we're discussing these cases in our tumor boards all the time. And so, and, and that's something I would definitely recommend that, you know, folks are doing when they're getting cases like this, because you want to look at the level of invasion. Uh, you want to look at the margins, you know, was this piecemeal? Was this on block? Uh, if you have an invasive component, is there a perineural invasion? Is there a lymphovascular invasion? Well differentiated, moderately differentiated. What's the patient's comorbidity status? Can they tolerate an abdominal surgery? If they had, let's say, if it's a right colectomy, if they had a liver transplant, well, you're not going to want to go back into the right upper quadrant anytime soon. So I, I think that's where you, you know, the, the textbook is helpful and you sort of go about risk, but you really sit down with the patient and you say, look, this is, this is what we'd be proposing that we do uh, for a potential benefit here are the risks. What would you be comfortable with? Would you be comfortable with doing a surgery and it turns out the lymph nodes are negative, but then we have a complication. Um, so it's really a frank conversation with the patient about surgery. And I would say something that's very helpful as you're preparing for these conversations, but then also for boards, I'm preparing for my colorectal boards is you have to have your NCCN guidelines like totally memorized. And so this is a nice um, outline of what to do with endoscopically resected malignant uh, colon polyps. Peter, anything you'd add there? Yeah, I think the important part here is um, talking to the patient honestly about their, their risk and risk factors. And um, I'll say that I, uh, Dave Schett's my mentor, we call it the calculated risks. You know, we're, we make all the calculations and the patient's taking the risk. And so they've got to be comfortable if you don't operate uh, that they may never know for, for many years whether there's a problem. Uh, and, and so if you've got somebody who's not willing to take any risk, then, then you do sometimes move forward. Tess, what about uh, the risk factors, you know, things that you look at? So um, I'd worry, you know, if lesions weren't resected in one piece, if you have a piecemeal uh, polyp excision, then you worry that your margins, I'd have less confidence in those margins. Um, and then uh, lymphovascular invasion, um, high, uh, high grade tumor, things like that would make me more concerned. 
So, you know, we'll bring it back to the patient and we'll sort of wrap up, you know, how, how we took care of them. So just to summarize, intramucosal adenocarcinoma, uh, margin positive for adenoma. Uh, so what are we doing, Tess? So given um, the margin was positive for adenoma, I would want to repeat the colonoscopy in a short interval, probably six months. And, and Tess, who's going to do that colonoscopy? Uh, I would do it because... Yeah, I want to. I want to have uh, a look at at my resection bed, and I want to keep close tabs on this. Uh, so I would plan to perform the first several um, before turning it back to the GI. John, John, do you agree? And, and why else would, would you want to do it? Yeah, I mean, if I need to take biopsies or if I need to assess it somehow, I mean, that, I, that's you know, I was mucking around in there, and so I think you know the GIs might be more nervous to start sticking biopsy forceps. Um, you know, I know what I did in there, so. Yeah, and I think the important part is that, that these polyps, it's like a, the, the root of a weed, you know, they, they may grow back and it may only, it may be 18 months later when it starts coming back. And if you send them right back to the GI guy and they scope it and they see anything, um, you, uh, you know, they're going to send it right back to you. Um, Tess, one thing, what about when you put clips on later on, what's, what's that look like afterwards? Do you know? When you go back and look at them? So at six months, I, the clips wouldn't, I would expect to be gone at that point. Um, but you, a, you'll see. Those clips still on there. What do you do? I'd leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> Good girl. Yeah. 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 You know, don't yeah. poke a skunk. Leave it alone. No, leave skunk. it alone. Yeah. Um, but usually, you know, you see like a, a, a scar, flight, flat white scar. You might see some granulation tissue, in which case, you know, is it granulation tissue, adenoma, you biopsy it. Yeah. And what if you see little bumps that don't really look like an adenoma next to it, John? What, what's that bump, do you know? I think just the, the bunching up of the mucosa as you're pulling it back together, leave it alone. Yeah. yeah. So, so really note that it will look a little bit abnormal, especially when you use the clips uh, along the way. Um, and, and I also want to let the, the, the audience know to think about going back to the beginning. Tess, when we start, first started taking off this polyp, if the polyp, you inject it with your injectate, and it doesn't lift, or you start to, to dissect and it won't lift, what do you do? So at that point, I'd be worried about uh, a cancer, more invasive lesion. Um, so I would probably phone a friend, ask someone to come up, take a look at it with me. And then if they agree, I'd probably proceed with a colectomy at that point. Yeah, and I think that's the other important message that when we when we designed this endoscopic step up approach, that you have to have your stop marks. Uh, and so in addition to knowing the criteria of what needs a resection, you need to know endoscopically what is a, what requires a resection. And so um, I think making those decisions in the OR are important. And it's just as this, when we come to later on, I think you want to look at it and you want to be, be sure that everything is clear before you send them back to their uh, GI docs. All right. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion team and we're nearly out of time for the session. Um, so uh, Pat, I'm gonna ask you to summarize some of the clinical pearls for this session. And I'm thrilled that we're gonna be officially calling these Tess's teaching point. So what do you got, Tess? So um, narrow band imaging, submucosal lifting, and then moving around the lesion with biopsy forceps are all things that you can do to assess the endoscopic resectability of these big colorectal polyps. Um, and then Haggett level is used for- yeah, is used for pedunculated polyps. The Kikuchi is used for sessile polyps and um, use estimates the, uh, or tells you the uh, submucosal level and is used to estimate the risk of nodal metastasis in T1 colorectal cancers. And then it's important to have discussion about the indications for segmental colectomy. Um, and you have to account when you're having these discussions for the risk of nodal disease Think about are patients going to adhere to frequent colonoscopies and then also consider patient comorbidity. Great. Peter, anything to add? Um, sure. I think the important part here is cork. Cork in, cork in your endo unit. And if you take out a big polyp, put it on a piece of cork so that pathologists will slice it so you can get a real haggard level. Uh, it's a shame when that doesn't happen. I got a few other points that I think I uh, want to want to verify. And this is the most, rule one, you know, Reagan, trust but verify. You know, somebody sends you a polyp, take the, get the slides, look at them with your pathologist to make sure you agree. Uh, and it really has saved me a lot of my career. And 
The second, uh, Marcelo Musknose, uh, that's what we're calling him, Marcelo Musknose, um, that you in your practice, uh, no matter where you are, will be introducing new technology, new techniques. Like when I first wanted to do ESD, um, for me, uh, I had to find a safe way to introduce it to my practice. I told the patient, and I started with polyps in the rectum that I could have done a TEM or a TAMIS on, uh, but I chose to do ESD, and then I had that as a backup. Um, and know that it's going to take you longer and know that you probably will fail uh, when you do this, but you have to keep moving forward. Otherwise, you never really advance. So for me, trust but verify and be, embrace new technology and techniques in your practice, but do it safely. And John, you've got to have a few things you want to end with. Yeah, well, everyone has, you know, fancy alliteration. So I'm going to call it Ableton's approach, as silly as that sounds. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about engaging the patient in the decision making. I mean, really, you know, as we talk about what Dr. Chet says, I mean, it's the patient taking the risk. So, you know, they need to be on board with whatever the decision is. And then, you know, as, as younger surgeons, we're always looking for that next wave, you know, so it was laparoscopy, endoscopy, you know, is the robot the next wave? Uh, you know, what are, what are the next waves in surgery? So lots more to discuss, uh, as always. And so we're going to actually touch on endoscopic management of uh, early rectal cancers in a later session. Uh, so as uh, Tess pointed out, if you're uh, at the beginning of our uh, session, if you're interested in learning more about specific topics in colorectal surgery, we have a, a Sunday evening virtual education series and our show notes will have some of the links. Uh, and so thanks for joining us for this clinical challenge in colorectal surgery. And I'll, I, I just got to finish up and say, you know, if you enjoyed it, uh, please take a minute or two out of your hectic day and leave us a review. And, um, and finally, uh, all together, as Behind the Knife would say, until next time, dominate, dominate the, day. the day. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.